Well, welcome to our construction site this morning as uh, we begin our extreme home makeover journey. Uh, last Sunday, we began uh, talking about Jesus Christ being that supernatural cornerstone. He was a stone that was rejected by men, but he was chosen by God, and he is precious. And what we're looking at today, you'll notice that we're on this uh, extreme home makeover site. Uh, we've got some construction tape because we're under construction. This ought to be on every marriage, by the way. Ought to be on every family, every home, every single adult's heart. That we are people that are under construction. God is not finished with us yet. If you're not dead, he's not done. Okay? And so we've got some things that we need to do here on this site. We need, we got some... We got some uh, walls that we've got to knock out. We've got some uh, renovations that need to happen. They're going to be happening inside and out. But I want you to notice this morning we're going to start uh, with a cornerstone. Because the cornerstone is the most important part of the building project. It was what happened just uh, uh, not too long ago. A husband who has been married for a number of years, his marriage is not working out. His question was, where do I start? The wife, just a few days later, uh, walked out of my office, and her question was, uh, where, where do I start? Uh, there was a parent that had a daughter uh, that was making some unwise decisions, and, and their question was, where, where do I start in parenting? Seems like it's all been messed up. Uh, there was a Another couple that uh, had a house full of children, and then one by one they went off to college and career, and pretty soon they're looking at each other across a kitchen table, and they're strangers. Where do you start? A single adult trying to find meaning and purpose, and, and wh where can I find real, real relationships that last? The question that rises in their heart is, where do I start? And so this morning, we're going to be looking at, on this construction site, you'll notice uh, this cornerstone has a date on it. And can anybody read this? 2023. Can anybody uh, see the, the address up here on the wall? That's right where you're sitting at, 7091 Proctor Road. So right here, right now, God wants to take some tools of his word by the Holy Spirit. And he wants to bring some needed transformation, some needed changes. It all starts with the cornerstone. It starts with Jesus. He gives us a healthy relationship with God, and he gives us healthy relationships with the near ones in our life. Now, who is this cornerstone? As you have your Bible open, chapter 2, verse number 20, who's this cornerstone, church? Jesus, oh yes. And we're being built up on him, on the foundation of apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. Same words that we read in Psalm 118, verse number 23, uh, last week, that, that there is a stone that was rejected that is now mentioned as a cornerstone, quoted by Jesus in the Gospels as himself, and also by the apostles in Acts chapter 4, uh, verse number 11. You see, the only one that could bring needed transformation according to the blueprint of the Word is the cornerstone. Only He can perform the healthy renovations that will transform marriages, families, and friendships. Only He can allow you to experience home life and relationships the way God intends. We're going to read together the Word of God, but notice here in Ephesians chapter 2, the relational language of the Bible. Have you ever noticed that, uh, this, uh, that there's a relational language of the Bible? And by the way, let me stop right here and say, uh, understand that we've got some kids in the room this morning. How many, how many uh, kids do we have in the room? Let me hear a shout out. Oh, that's pretty weak, pretty weak. <laughs> Got any kids in the room? Let's see it. Woo! All right, very good. Now, I'm going to invite all the children. We had some in our 9 o'clock hour as well, but I want, to be, uh, I want to invite you to be a part of Pastor's Pals. And so you'll notice in the sermon today uh, that there's going to be a mystery word that's going to come up on the screen. 
And if you get four out of the six mystery words out of this six weeks, uh, we're going to have a pastor's pal pool party. And I want to invite you to be a part of that. I don't want any children to miss out on this journey. So I want you to uh, really key into, your, it's going to come up when you're least expect it during the sermon today. I want you to get that mystery word. I want you to be my pal. I want you to be my friend in doing that. But notice here the relational language. And by the way, isn't it great to see students this morning with their Bibles open and their hearts open before the Lord. Amen. So grateful to have our, our students gathered here today. Notice verse 1, we were once dead in our sin, but verse 5, we're made alive in Christ. Verse 2, we were once at a low point far away from God, but now, verse 6, we've been raised with Jesus, seated in the heavenlies. Verse number uh, 3, we were once destined to judgment, but verse number 8, God has rescued us by His grace. Verse 11, we were far away from God with no access to God, and but verse number 13, we've been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, this morning with your Bibles open, Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to read verses 11 through 22. Now you say, now pastor, why is it that every Sunday you invite us to stand? And why is it every Sunday that you invite us to read the Bible out loud? Because I want you to know what to do in public. We read publicly so that when you go home, you can also read the Bible out loud. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing from the Word of God. So I'm going to invite you, if you will, to stand with me as we honor the reading of God's eternal, life-changing, inerrant word of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is writing to the believers in the first century, and he is reminding them of who they were before Christ and the difference that Christ has made in their life. It's a great reminder for us. So read this as you see it up on the screen. So then remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. At that time, you were without Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel, foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who has made both groups one and has torn down the dividing wall of hostility in his flesh. He is made of no effect, the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations so that he might create in himself one new man from the two resulting in peace. He did this so that he might reconcile both God in one body through the cross by which he put to hostility to death. He, he came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you that were far away, and peace to those that were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the members of God's household. Build on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being built together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Father, we pray this morning in this place that this would be a construction site. That you would begin to do incredible, unspeakable things in our hearts, in our homes, in our relationships. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for standing. Now notice here the description of who we are in the Bible page, that we are a household. God desires if, if you're a follower of Him that you make up a household. If, you're, if your home 
is under the banner of Jesus' love and Jesus is the Lord of your home, he is building a household. He is uh, making a building or a temple. Now, as we begin this extreme home makeover journey, I want you to notice that there are several things uh, that you'll have. Every family is going to have a resource. You say, Pastor, are you giving out hammers today? No. Uh, but we are giving out free resources. There's going to be student suites for our students. Let me hear our students this morning. If you're a student in the room. Yeah, there you all. Yeah, uh, well, you can do better than that. All the students in the room, let's hear a shout this morning. Woo! All right. Very good. We got them all over, okay? Student suites. We've got table talks. And so if you're married, if you've got children, table talks will work. And there's free resources. You've got kids, we've got a kid's corner. And we want to invite you to be a part of these. Also, we've got some taking it outside the door. In other words, how your family, my family can live uh, missionally. And so uh, the other thing you need to know about this is everyone gets to talk. You say, but pastor, I'm an introvert. Listen to me. You've got the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will lead you to talk. Second of all, let me, or third of all, let me encourage you uh, that this is going to be like church, and it's not going to be like church. We're, we're not just going to talk about things of God. We're actually going to experience God. Anybody up for that? Okay. And then I want to encourage you to be willing to go first and in sharing, involve everyone in your family. He you say, now, Pastor, what, what are these table talks? What are, what are they about? You'll, you'll find a free resource. I'll show you where to get them before we leave here today. Uh, but they'll, they'll have fun things like at, at, your, at your table. You'll be having conversations about if you could be any vegetable, which vegetable would you be? You can't have fun with this, right? Uh, what do you like most about your age and what do you like least about your age? Can you imagine your eight-year-old son answering that question? And dad, it would be great for your son to hear you share the answer to that question. Creating meaningful conversations that go beyond just the surface things that so often we go to, to get down to the deep things that God wants to do in our families. And you say, now pastor, why are we doing all this? Why is this so important? Well, the Marriage Commission released a report several years ago it said that decades, they said, they found out that decades of fragmented relationships, an increased divorce, fatherless homes, cohabitation, crime, materialism, and self-serving parental priorities have rendered a large segment of multiple generations, listen to this, relationally bankrupt. We have seemingly lost the skills and even the motivation of knowing how to love. Honest assessment of of, uh, that have been done reveal that many who marry have never seen the kind of intimate home life that they've dreamt about. Young couples who express an interest in marriage, a deep longing for a committed lifelong relationships, admit that they have little reassurance that that reality of this kind of relationship could ever exist. And they never viewed a healthy lifelong marriage, but they desire one like the couple I shared with you last week, that they're about to get married and they've never seen anyone on either side of their family make it past 10 years of marriage. It's reality. In a similar way, our parents are feeling inadequate. We're feeling unprepared as we face uh, the critical responsibility of raising a child. A vulnerable, a vulnerable assessment for many parents would find that they don't really know what mean being a father is like or being what a mother looks like they have few role models and experiences to fill in the blanks the study goes on to say that now is the time this is a time that we need to get out god's tools it now is a time that we need to reach down and we need to get god's measurements and we need to begin to do things according to God's word and use the resources that God has given to us by his spirit through his word and allow God to change us from the inside out. Well, you'll notice today's sermon is entitled, Jesus is the cornerstone, you can do it and he can help. You, you, can, you can do this and Jesus will be the foundation and he'll help you 
to bring this. Now, let's focus on chapter 2, verse number 20. You'll notice it up on the screen. And we're members of God's household. That's who we are. And we're being built up on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. Let me point out to you several things about a cornerstone. A cornerstone is the first stone that is laid in the building. It is the most important stone. Why is that? Because if a cornerstone is crooked, guess what's going to happen to the, to the structure? You can speak back to me. It's going to do what? It's going to be crooked. But if the cornerstone is strong and it's firm and it is right, well, what's going to happen to the structure? It's going to go upright. A lot of times we, we, we look at crevices in the wall and we try to repair the wall, but the whole problem is we need a good foundation. And I'm not pointing today to a brick in the wall. I'm pointing to a person who has risen from the dead, who has kicked the devil's teeth out, and who is able to renovate relationships by his power. His name is Jesus Christ. He is able uh, to do that in our life. He, he gives security and shape and stability. Uh, you say, what kind of uh, cornerstone is this? He is a living cornerstone, and he wants to grow up in your marriage. He wants to grow up in your children. He wants to grow up in your workplace, in your relationships and your friendships. He wants to grow up in all of those things to bring glory to God. Now, if Jesus is the cornerstone of your life, let's have some confession, okay? You'll notice this up on the IMAX screen. Let's just confess this out loud together. Say this with me. The cornerstone of my life is Jesus. The cornerstone of my home is Jesus. Let's make that our confession of our lips. Because to experience the kind of relationships that God intends, it starts, it begins with Jesus as the cornerstone. He defines the priorities. He gives direction. He gives the stability. He gives single adults the structure to help make decisions to experience relationships the way God would have them to make. Now, we understand that in our mind, do we not? But let's move beyond our head to our hearts. What would happen if Jesus showed up at your home? When he walked in the door, what, what would he notice? Are there any needed changes in the foyer of your home? Particularly if you have students in the student suite this morning, what would it be like for God to welcome you at home? How, how do you think God would do that? You're home. How was your day? Any good things happen? Any challenges happen? Might God want to bring some needed renovations in the foyer of our home of how we welcome and how we receive one another what would happen if jesus moved into the living room of your home would jesus see anything that needs to change in your living room maybe jesus would want it want you to have some game nights with some laughter for a change what would happen if jesus showed up at your kitchen table the kitchen table uh, should be a place of deep communion and of relationships, and so many times it's a place where we quickly get our belly filled and we go about our daily business. What would happen if we move from surface conversations that matter nothing to go to deep conversations that will enrich our children's life, that will bless our spouse, that will encourage others to be a part of a loving community like that? What would happen? How about if Jesus showed up in your dining room? You say, oh, wait a minute, Pastor. We've got one of those, but we never use them. You know? We don't use our dining room. It's, it's where we put things. You know, uh, uh, Can we have any vulnerable conversations here this morning uh, in that? Might Jesus want to fill up your dining room? Might Jesus want some neighbors and some friends to come and have a cup of coffee or tea and to enjoy some meaningful, caring conversations. Now, what would happen if Jesus moved into our bedroom? Now, you say, no, pastor, that is the unspeakable word that starts with an S. We don't talk about that in Baptist churches. Okay. 
What would happen if Jesus moved into the most private places of your life and brought about some needed vitality, needed renovation in the most intimate relationships uh, that you have? Imagine Jesus walking in your home. So I want to invite you, if you will, to, if with your listening notes to write down this first statement. That the cornerstone that transforms our hearts is Jesus. The cornerstone that transforms our hearts is Jesus. Now, how many pastor's pals do we have here this morning? You'll notice a logo coming up on the screen. I'm helping you out now this morning because I really want you to come to my pool party. All right? And guess what the mystery word might be? Okay, all the kids, all the, all the pastor's pals, what's the mystery word? All right, let's hear it for our kids this morning. Transforms. We got week number one, all right? Okay, very good. It transforms our heart. Now, what is so transforming about Jesus being our cornerstone. I want you to say with me four eternal truths that we find in this Bible page and throughout the Bible. The first uh, statement I want you to say with me is that God loves me. Say that with me. God loves me. Notice in chapter 2, verse number 1, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We are walking according to the course of the world. The spirit of disobedience was working within us. We were under the wrath of God. But verse number 5, but God who is rich and mercy has made us alive and he has saved us by his grace we didn't have anything to do with it it is the work of God it is through faith in Jesus Christ that we are saved you know what that shows to us that God loves me God loves me no question what does that do to your heart you see Christianity is not a list of do do do's and don't don't don'ts the Christianity is not about behavioral modification. It's not about uh, having bad people to begin to do good things. That's not Christianity. No, Christianity is about taking dead people in their sin and making them alive through the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. You see, that is God's mercy. That is God's love. God wants you to know that he loves you. He loves you. Now, what does that do to your heart? As you receive this love of Jesus in your heart, you want to reciprocate it. As you freely receive that love, what do you want to do? You want to freely give that love. Now, how many of us have, have children in the room? Okay, children. All right, very good. All right, hands all over the room. I have children in the room. What would happen if, if your child, maybe a teenager, maybe an adult, came into your home one day and said, hey, hey, dad, hey, mom, uh, I, I just, I, I just want to sit here at the kitchen table with you, and I, I just want to sit and listen to what you would have to say. <laughs> now, after you passed out <laughs> and got back out off the floor, you, what, what, if, what would that do to your heart as a parent? It, it, it would be incredible love for your child to do that. Listen to that. If we feel that way as earthly parents, how much more does our heavenly Father feel that way when we just show up in His presence and say, Abba, speak to me. I, I just want to hear everything that you would have to say to me. You see, the God who loves us wants us to love Him. We freely receive, we're to freely give. Jot this second statement down, and you can say it out loud with me, is that God cares for me. Say that with me. God cares for me. Notice in chapter 2, verse number 10, that you are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which He has chosen for you to walk in before the foundation of the world. What does that mean? That God cares about you. You are his poinonia. You are his beautiful workmanship. It's the word poem or artist uh, rendition. You are God's creation. God is intimately involved in your life. He knows when you got up. He knows when you're sitting down. He knows your thought of far off. He knows where you've been. He knows where you're going to. He loves everything about you. And notice this. This will blow your mind. But he's already prepared some good works, and he wants you to walk in them as you follow him. It's amazing. 
You say, God cares for you. This is what we call caring involvement. God is caringly involved in our life. Then I want you to jot down this third statement. Not only does God love you and God cares for you, but say this out loud with me, church. God accepts me. God accepts me. It blows my mind, the scripture that we read. The Bible says that we were far away. We, we were strangers. We were foreigners to the covenants of promise. We were, not, we were not of the Jewish nation. But the Bible says that Jesus Christ is our peace, and he has tore down the middle wall of perdition. The Bible says that he has reconciled us unto himself. And the Bible says that we now are the ones who are his household. You see what God's done? God has taken a wall that was there, and, and, he, and he's... He's knocked it out. There was a middle wall. You say, no, Pastor, what's this talking about? This is talking about racial hatred between Jews and Gentiles. And in the early church, you know what you find? You find that God is, he, he's, knocking down, he's knocking down some walls. He's breathing it down. Now, let me ask you a question. Are there any walls in marriage that might need to be broken down? Any emotional communication impasse, any sense of bitterness or anger or even guilt and condemnation that's welled up inside of you. I want to tell you, God is in the building business and a lot of times he has to deconstruct things so that he can construct things. He's in that way. You see, the Bible says that God has accepted us. You know what that means? We have freely been accepted by God, and how do we reciprocate? We freely accept God. Have you accepted God? You accepted his love for you. You accepted his son, the Lord Jesus, who has been your peace, who, who provides peace for us. But notice this fourth statement, and you can say it out loud with me, is that God involves me. God, in, say it with me, church, God involves me. Hey, we, the Bible says in verse 21, we're being built together by him. We're growing into a holy sanctuary in the Lord. We're being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. You see, God, this God of the universe desires for you to be a part of what he's building. He, he's inviting you and I to be a part of the building of relationships. How can you build a better work environment? God, God is at work in your workplace, and he wants you to join him. God is at work in your marriage, if you're married, and he wants you to join him in loving your spouse the way he's loved them. God is at work in your children's life. He is building your children, and he wants you to join him. It is a reciprocation. He, he freely gives us that invitation to involve us, and we're to respond with our hearts. Now, when you experience the love and acceptance of God and his son, your foundation in life changes, changes. You see, I, I could say honestly, before I came to Christ, my my foundation was very shaky. It, it, was, it was like sand. Uh, you ever stood in, in the water when the tide's coming in and going out? The sand just sort of moves underneath your feet. That was my life. It's a great, great description of my life. I had nothing stable uh, to stand on. But man, when I came to Jesus Christ, I, I found a, a solid rock. I, I found something that I could, I, I could rely upon, the Word of God, His Word. I, I found uh, that there is a vast resource that He has for me that, that gives me a capacity that I never dreamt possible. So would it be all right this morning, church family, if, if we don't just hear another Bible sermon and go away unchanged, would it be all right if we actually do the Bible? Well, that's some of you, okay, that's some of you, all right? Now, now I could see, see a face over here saying, well, Pastor, what Bible verse are we going to do? Well, let's just do this one that we looked at last week, Psalm chapter 118, verse number 1. The Bible says, I give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, His mercy endures forever. So in just a moment, I want us to fill this place with praise to Jesus. Okay? You'll notice that there's a, a fill in the blank, and, and then just a moment you're going to be filling the blank in. I'm grateful that Jesus is because of what? 
Remember when Jesus came in on Palm Sunday? Uh, the Pharisees had said, hey, keep your, your, your disciples quiet. Tell them to stop praising. And Jesus said, if they don't praise me, the rocks are going to cry out. So this morning, let's don't let any rocks take our place, right? So uh, I want you to think right now how, how you would feel in this sentence. In just a moment, I want you to share it with your neighbor next to you. Uh, if it's a family member, friend, whoever it is next to you, I want you to uh, bear witness. I'm grateful Jesus is patient because I mess up all the time. Or, or I'm grateful that Jesus is forgiving because uh, I blow it. All right? So those might be some uh, real vulnerable praises that we could praise Jesus for, real things that we could praise the Lord for. So I want you to uh, take a time. You've got that in your mind. Notice I'm stalling so you could think. All right, fill in the blank. All right, I want you to turn to the person next to you and fill in that blank. Let's just fill this place right now with praise. Oh, yeah, get it louder, get it louder, get, let the praise, uh, raise your voices, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm grateful that Jesus is, what did you say, Jesus is? Yeah. Oh, what a great, praise the Lord, it's great. You can imagine the angels in heaven are looking down right now thinking those people down in Sarasota, they're not just listening to the Bible, they're actually doing the Bible. How amazing that is. I want you to jot this second statement down. The cornerstone that transforms my life, my heart, is Jesus. But jot this second statement down that the cornerstone that forms my home is Jesus. The cornerstone that forms my home is Jesus. Now, pastors, pals, what's the mystery word? Transforms. But now we find that Jesus, as the cornerstone, he forms my home. This cornerstone gives stability. It gives structure. What, what about the transforming love of Jesus? Might he want to form in your life? When, when we're built on the cornerstone, might he change our language and how we speak to each other? Are you with me this morning? When Jesus is the cornerstone, might it change the way I think and I view others? When, when Jesus is my cornerstone, might it change some priorities that I would have in my daily week? Okay, So I want you to notice here that there, there are four ingredients to healthy relationships. Many of you in connect groups have gone through this this morning. This is what I call relational language. And for many of us, we've never heard it before. We've heard Bible verses but we've never known what it means to speak the Bible. So four ingredients to help the relationships. First of all, mutual giving, mutual giving. And that is the words, say it with me, I love you. That is so very important, mutual giving. We are people who have been loved by God, and now we have a capacity to love others that are imperfect when they leave the kitchen in a mess or they don't make up their beds or they don't have the grade that we expected or we're late for dinner is it possible that we could love someone mutually give love the way God has loved us when we didn't make up our bed can I get a witness this morning amen or oh me Love in, it involves giving things it involves giving attention it's what I call a no phone zone Looking a person in the eye, giving a person appreciation. Thank you for making dinner tonight, Mom. It, it means a respect that as there are ideas that are being shared, that I give value to another person. It is mutual giving. Another statement here, relational language, is caring involvement. Caring involvement. I care for you. Now notice this. You might not have had this capacity before, but when you've come to Christ, God cares for you. And because he cares for you, now you can give something that you've now freely received from God. Caring involvement means the same compassion that you've received that you give it to those that could benefit from it. So as a parent, it may mean helping a child with homework. Our school project. As a spouse, it might mean going to the grocery store, whatever that means. It might mean going to an event of your choosing. That would be the work of the Holy Spirit, would it not? Going to the grocery store. 
uh, taking, uh, or it could be taking a day off. I know that you've been stressful. Let me just take a day off and let's just spend all day together. Let's go for a walk on Siesta Key. Now, I'm new to Sarasota, and I'm amazed at how many people live in Sarasota and never go to the beach. Can I encourage you not to receive the grace of God in vain? Amen? Get, get the full benefit of living in paradise. Everybody else is in barbaric lands. I feel sorry for snowbirds. You're leaving paradise, and you're going to barbaric places. Caring involvement. I care enough for you. I'm going to take the day off and spend it with you. Then uh, another thing that ought to be in our uh, communication is vulnerable communication. And that is that I accept you. As you freely receive God's acceptance, you can freely give his acceptance. You have a capacity now because of what God's given to you. Now you can accept people who are different from you. Means vulnerably sharing acceptance of one another. Let me ask you a question, parents. What does your child have to do for you to accept them? Come on, you can talk back to me. What does your son need to do for you to say, I'm so proud of you? What does your daughter have to do for you to say, as a mother, I'm so proud of you? What do they have to do, church? Talk to me. Nothing. Nothing. That is God's acceptance of you, and that's the acceptance that we're to give to one another in, in parenting. When, when our children come home uh, from school, receive them the way God receives you. You say, no, Pastor, I have to get balloons. You might need to. Hey, let's get a celebration. When that kid walks in that door, close that computer, set down your cell phone, turn off the television, and sit down and say, how did your day go today? Accept them. That's what our, our students this morning and their student suite wrote down, what it would mean like for God to receive them at their home. It's incredible. It's a key to parenting. And then there's a fourth uh, communication, a language that we've got to learn. And can I say, can I be vulnerable with you? I knew nothing of this language until I allowed the great commandment to begin to change my life, the great commandment of Jesus. And the fourth one is this, and that is joint accomplishment. And that is, I need you. We have received God's invitation. God says to you and me, I need you. I want you to be a part of my building, what I'm doing. And it is good for us to look at our near ones in our life. And by the way, if you're married, who might that near one be? You can talk to me this morning. That's right, your spouse. If you've got children, guess who that might be? If you've got, anybody got grandchildren in the room? Okay, and guess who that might be? Joint accomplishment. You see, the key to a growing marriage is joint accomplishment, a growing dependence on each other, a realizing that I need God and I need my spouse, a growing dependence on each other. Why don't we just pause right now and just pray? <laughs> you say, Pastor, oh, what, what should we pray? Notice there's a prayer prompt that comes up on the screen as well as in your listening notes. And I want you to listen to the Lord as you begin to pray this prayer. Jesus, thank you for being the model of love for our home. Help me to love my family like you love me. Make me more what? Change me. Change me. Can we be vulnerable this morning just in the presence of God as we look at our cornerstone? Is there anything that the Lord would want to change? And I would assure you, as you're listening to the Lord, He doesn't say to you, you're okay, no problem, you don't need to change. He doesn't say that to me, He doesn't say that to anyone. Listen to the Lord. Where, where is it? Where's the Lord want to change you? Maybe He wants to change your language. Maybe you've been sarcastic. Maybe He wants to change your attitude. You've been impatient. Lord, make me, make me more patient like you, Jesus. Make me more accepting, Lord. I, I've been judgmental. God, make me more like you, Jesus. You've got open arms. You're not, you're not shaking your finger at me. God, you've got open arms. Make me more like that. Okay, let's, let's bow together in prayer. And as we bow together in prayer, would you just pray, Jesus. Jesus, thank you for being the model of love for our home. Help me. Oh, Jesus, help me to love my family the way you love me. Make me more, and fill in that blank. Pray that prayer, make me more. 
Maybe you want to pray that prayer out loud if you're sitting next to your spouse or a child or family member. Pray that prayer out loud. Lord, make me more. Say, fill in that blank. Yes, Jesus, we're, we're asking you, Lord, you are the cornerstone. We're asking, Lord, that you would bring some needed renovations in our relationships. And God, in a relationship of marriage, Lord, we really need you. As it comes to parenting, God, we need you. As, as students this morning going into school tomorrow, God, we really need you to be the foundation, the the one that shapes our conversations and leads us in our life. Now I want to ask you just now as you're bowing in the presence of God, if you will, look underneath you. Not physically, but uh, relationally. I want you to look underneath you. What, what are you standing on today? You, you may be here today and your world is... Is, is sifting sand it's shifting all underneath you it's very unstable you say Michael it's like the world news today I'm just so unstable can I encourage you to take a step to the cornerstone this cornerstone is not a block of, of rock he is a real living person and if you would imagine him today maybe you would imagine Jesus with a bearded face and sandaled feet and a long, long flowing robe. Or maybe you would picture him as a risen, glorified Christ. However you want to picture him, I want you to picture him with his arms open to you. And he is saying, come to me. Would you respond to him just now? Would you say, yes, Jesus. I want to step out of sifting sand and I want to stand in a relationship with your love. He died on the cross for your sin to remove that barrier between you and God. He rose again on the third day. He lives today to receive you. Would you, would you walk into his arms? Would you feel his warm embrace? And as you do, would you say, yes, Jesus, I believe in you. I trust in you. The Bible says that whoever believes on him, on Jesus, will not be put to shame. He removes your guilt. He removes your sin. You see, we all want to be better friends. We all want to be better spouses. We all want to be better parents. We all want to be better children. But listen to this. You cannot give what you've not received. Receive the cornerstone today. Receive his love by grace. Now, if you're here this morning, and you would say, uh, Pastor, I just sense that God is moving me. I really want to establish my home on this cornerstone. I, I want to be a part of this extreme home makeover journey. I'm going to ask you, if you will, just stand with me all across this building. Just stand to your feet. Let's all stand together. You say, I, I really desire my marriage, my family, my friendships to be built on this. I'm going to invite you in just a moment to come and kneel at the altar. I'm going to invite husbands, if you'll take your wives by the hand and, and come and, and find a place to kneel. If you can't kneel physically, maybe you just want to come and move up front and stand uh, just as a sign of commitment. If you're with your children, you may want to bring your children with you this morning. You're just simply saying today, I want Jesus Christ to form our home, form my relationships. If you're a young single, maybe you want to come with a friend. Now I'm going to invite you, if you will, just to pray together. Whoever that friend, that family member is, let me encourage you that if you're a dad or a husband, that you would begin to lead that prayer. If you're a single mom, lead that prayer this morning of your family. Just simply express your heart, Jesus, we want you to be the cornerstone of our home. We want you to be the transforming one that would change our hearts. Just pray that. Pray blessings over one another. Pray for God to bring needed breakthroughs. Pray for God to 
bring healing maybe to troubled relationships. Maybe I'm speaking to parents here today and you've got a child that is far away from God. Maybe you want to pray, oh God, would you allow the cornerstone to begin to shape our conversations with this one who has broken our heart. Pray for that prodigal child. Pray for God to change things. Father, we're thankful today that we can bow in your presence. God, we have moved from where we're at, and we're moving just physically to where we believe that you are. You are the cornerstone. And God, I, I'm praying, I'm agreeing together with every mom, dad. I'm agreeing together with every friend, every single adult who said, I want to start my life right building on the cornerstone. God, I, I pray your blessing over these friends. I ask, oh God, for those uh, today that maybe their hearts are broken because uh, Jesus has not been evident in the home. Father, we want to pray today that Jesus would not just be evident, but he would be president in the home. Oh God, rule over our families. We're praying this, Lord. We're praying for our children this morning. We're bringing them to the altar. And we're praying, oh God, your blessing over them. We're praying that they would be filled with your peace and your presence. Oh God, we pray this now in dedication to you. We dedicate our homes to the cornerstone. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you, if you will, to move back to your seats. And as you move back, let me ask you, uh, any pastor's pals, did you, every, all the pastor's pals get the words this morning? Okay. Okay. All right, now, as, you, as you're moving back to your seat, let me encourage you, if you're here this morning, and you would say, Pastor, as you are praying for Jesus to be the cornerstone, I prayed and received Christ, what do I need to do next? I want to invite you, if you will, to find a friend with one of these badges called a Next Step badge. I'll, I'll have mine on this morning, Next Step. They're men and women. They're going to be up front and also in the foyer and out in the plaza area. If you'll just stop by and say, hey, I prayed to receive Christ today, and, and I want to know what the next step is. Or, or maybe you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I've accepted Christ, but I want to take that next step of baptism. We'd love to help you with that. Or... If anybody's hungry today and, and, you would, and you say, Pastor, I would like to be a member of the church. I'd like to know what it means to be a member of Sarasota Baptist Church. I'd like for you to be my pastor. We're going to be having a free lunch for those that are interested in being a part. Now, if you're already members, you can't eat, all right? Uh, you, uh, but if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'd like to do that, uh, Liliana and I would love to treat you to lunch today. So over in our student building, Right across the plaza, if you'll see anybody with a Next Step badge, they'll begin to point you in that direction. Now, notice as your pastor that, that I, I don't leave you wondering what to do next. If you'll notice in your listening notes, there's some Beyond Sunday challenges. And so, as you're having lunch today, let me encourage you to share what you shared out of Psalm 118. That, that I, I praise Jesus because... All right? Share what you, what, what you experienced in that. And then the next thing I want to encourage you to do is engree, engage in Bible reading. We're making this very simple. We're reading through the book of Ephesians. We're reading one chapter a day, and we're going to read it four times. I've written a daily prompt uh, that would help and engage your heart in devotion to the Lord. And so you'll find that either on the app or you can find that on the website. By the way, last month we had 5,000 people access the app. It's amazing. It's incredible. And then let me encourage you, the next, uh, the ex next uh, challenge I would give to you is to access the resources that we have. Now, in order to do that, you're going to need to scan the QR code. Now, I'm speaking an unknown language right now. I'm not sure my daughters have taught me how to do this. Actually, you... You, you uh, zoom in on that code up on the screen. Let's do this together. And then automatically there's a link, boom. And it opens up to that link. 
And then all the things that you would need, the, the, uh, the table talks. And let me encourage you uh, to take an afternoon this week and at least have one, one meal together as a family and that you do a table talk, all right? And then if you've got kids, there's a kid's corner, there's a student suite, there's also missional challenges. So great missional challenges for you to carry out this week, how your, your family can be living his mission. Let me encourage you to go beyond just this Sunday conversation. Let's really allow Jesus to transform some things in our home. Do that extreme home makeover. Now, we're about to leave, but as we're about to leave, let me just say a word of blessing. As your pastor, my heart is so full this morning. I got a report. I just sent you out the first quarter uh, giving letters. Many of you got that by email. Others are getting it by uh, by uh, by mail, snail mail, uh, but whatever you choose. But I was so encouraged that over a quarter time, we've gone from 501 regular givers to over 800 regular givers. Is that incredible? So I, I, I just celebrate. I just celebrate the generous people you are. You are the kind of people that changes the world. You're generous people. And as you give to support the ministry and also the missions of this local church, you're changing the world through what we're collectively doing together. We're, we could do more together than what we could ever do apart. So I just want to uh, thank you for that. Uh, some of you are first-time givers. Let me encourage you to become regular givers. Uh, those that are regular givers, don't lose heart. Keep giving. We want to continue to make a difference uh, for the kingdom. And maybe you're not a part of the giving, uh, the generosity of this community. Let me encourage you to consider prayerfully what God would have you to give uh, to this local body. Let's, uh, let's pray a prayer of commission as we would leave out of here this morning. Let's all stand together. Uh, let me hear it from my pastor's pals this morning. How would it go with our pastor's pals? What's our mystery word today? transform all right very good all right let's bow together father i pray your peace would fill every heart every home here today we know jesus that you're the prince of peace and we pray that your peace that surpasses all human understanding would fill our minds and hearts in christ we leave here today in the name of jesus amen god bless you have a great day